In fifth place, we have Diamond Proof of an SA Scandal. Alrighty, can I get a show of hands? What's the first thing you think of when I say priest and scandal in the same sentence? Do those two words have the initials SA? I had a feeling. So those are words that this platform doesn't really like, so pardon me while I try to dodge them, and I apologize in advance for how comical I'm about to sound. This affair kicks off on June 22nd of 2023, when the Society of Jesus of Bolivia acknowledged that it had received from the Vatican a copy of the diary belonging to the late Alfonso Pedrejas, who was a priest accused of taking advantage of dozens of minors. He died of cancer in 2009, so he never faced repercussions for his actions in his lifetime. Primarily known as Father Pica, he was placed in boarding schools for impoverished youth, primarily in Cochabamba in the 1970s. So the diary was turned over to the prosecutors in that same city for that reason, and it was discovered that the late priest kept detailed accounts of the underage horrors he committed in Bolivia. So at one point, according to his diary, he told a colleague about the crimes, only to be advised not to mention it in future confessions. Ah, uh, yeah. The good old ignore it and it'll go away approach. The priest's nephew, Fernando Pandreas, discovered a printout of the diary in an attic and turned it over to a major newspaper. And in its pages, the priest wrote lines such as, I hurt so many people. Too many. The newspaper publishing excerpts from the diary prompted an outcry in Bolivia and an official Vatican response. Go figure. Pope Francis promised to ensure the full cooperation of the church to work alongside the government as it investigates the allegations. He also expressed sorrow over the ongoing revelations in the Catholic Church, calling them deplorable. Yeah, okay. And remind me again, what does uh, full cooperation mean? Coming from an institution that covers up more than it discloses, pardon me if I take that with um, a pound of salt. Bolivian President Luis Arce has called on his country to strengthen controls to prevent foreign priests with, you know, a history of sexual crimes from entering the country. Which, you know, it's fine, and obviously I support that, and, you know, great. But it's hard to find that out when the church is super skilled at covering things like that up. Priest Jordi Bortomio, a sex crime investigator from the Vatican, arrived in Bolivia back in May to gather information about prevention efforts being undertaken within the church to stop these kinds of crimes. Well, that sums it up right there for me, folks. The church has its own sex crime investigator. It's such a problem that they have a specialist. And before someone feels like fighting me on this, specialty jobs like that only exist because there's a need and a problem. That's not the kind of job that just got created out of midair for kicks. The investigation into Pendrejas joins at least 12 other ongoing judicial probes into allegations of clergy sex crimes in Bolivia. So the Bolivian Episcopal Conference has said, you know, one priest has already received a 10-year sentence for his crimes, while another priest, Milton Murillo, was sent to pretrial detention for three months in May. New testimony against Murillo emerged in the wake of the Pendreja scandal as prosecutors called on survivors to step forward. Okie dokie. Time to move on before I start hissing like a tea kettle, and I swear by the end of today, I'm going to turn into a caricature with like a storm cloud over my head. In fourth place, we have a drastic loss of support. So in Germany, people who are formerly members of a church pay a so-called church tax that helps to finance it in addition to the regular taxes that the rest of the population have to pay. If they register their departure though with local authorities, they don't have to pay it anymore. Granted, there are some exceptions for like low earners, folks who are jobless, retirees, students, and etc. But I'm pretty sure here in North America, all money given is through donation, and you just, you know, stop going on your own terms if you want, but it's more complicated elsewhere. But also feel free to let me know in the comments if I'm wrong, because I'm not a certain expert on Catholicism. Anywho, more than half a million people formally left the Catholic Church in Germany last year, which was significantly higher than the previous record. The German Bishops' Conference said specifically that over 522,000 people left the church last year, which is up from around 350,000 in 2021. In comparison, only 1,447 people joined the Catholic Church, which was around the same as the previous year. The departures left the number of Catholic Church members in Germany at nearly 21 million, which is just under a quarter of the population. Now, the Bishops' Conference didn't detail reasons for departures in this annual release of statistics. But many people have turned their backs on the church in recent years, you know, amid follow from scandal over bad things done by clergy and others. Wow, I'm shocked. In 2018, a church commissioned report concluded that at least 3,667 people were harmed by clergy in Germany between 1946 and 2014, with more than half the victims being uh, under 13 and nearly a third of that served as altar boys. Various dioceses tasked law firms or others to put together reports on their own past handling of these cases which has led to massive tensions in the Cologne Archdiocese, where the Archbishop, Cardinal Rainer Maria Wolkai, drew widespread criticism for his handling of a report he commissioned. His offer of resignation has been pending with the Pope for months. Now, an independent report in the Munich Archdiocese, where the late Pope Benedict served as Archbishop from 1997 to 1982, last year faulted the handling of cases by a string of church officials past and present, including the then-Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger himself, the head of the Central Committee of German Catholics,
Catholics, an influential organization, said she was sad but not surprised at the number of departures last year, and has uh, called for reforms and more thorough investigations. Yeah. Good luck with that one. I ain't holding my breath. Number three on this list is God's Banker. God's Banker was the nickname that they gave to a man named Roberto Calvi. Forbes writes, it was described as a scene straight out of an Alfred Hitchcock film. The man's corpse dangled from an orange nylon rope tied to scaffolding under London's Blackfriars Bridge. He was dressed in a grey suit with a white waistcoat and a blue striped shirt. He wore shoes and socks but no tie or belt. An expensive watch on his wrist was stopped at 1.52 am and nearly 12 pounds worth of pieces of bricks were stuffed into his trousers. A young postal clerk had made the grim discovery on his way to work on the morning of June 18, 1982 and alerted the police. Officers who examined the body found a wallet containing around 13,000 in various currencies, Italian, Austrian shillings, American dollars, Swiss francs, and a passport bearing the name Gian Roberto Calvini. This man was found dead, but why and how does the church play into this? Well, the local writes, the chairman of Milan's Banco Ambrosiano, in which the Vatican was the main shareholder, had been found guilty of illegally exporting billions of lire. He shaved off his mustache and fled to London where he was murdered. An American archbishop wanted for questioning was granted immunity by the Vatican, while five Italians were acquitted of the crime in 2007. Basically, this guy was in deep with some very bad people, and the Vatican were some of those people. Also pretty questionable just literally giving immunity to this archbishop because you can. It should also be noted that this banker was believed to be in deep with the mafia as well. The Vatican seems to have an interesting choice in friends. Number two on this list is World War II. I don't think it's unfair to say that World War II might have been the closest that we got to a fight where it truly was good versus evil. One side was fighting for freedom and the other side represented death and hatred. Thankfully for all of us, freedom won out in the end and the horrifying regime that was trying to take over collapsed. After World War II, some people had to pay for what they did. After all, it saw arguably the worst genocide in history and some horrible wartime atrocities. People were put on trial and individuals who hadn't been supporting the freedom side were heavily scrutinized. The Vatican during this time was noticeably pretty silent though. Who did they support during this period of time and why didn't they do anything? It's believed that Jewish people were actually rounded up outside of the Pope's window at one time or another, and the Pope would have been able to see firsthand what was actually going on behind closed doors. Why didn't he do anything to stop this? The actions, or lack thereof, of the Pope at the time, Pope Pius XII, have been under heavy fire for years. It's even been thrown around that this Pope collaborated with these deathly acts and was on board with them. Now there isn't any proof of this, but the Vatican isn't necessarily opening their doors and having people come in to check their records either. They would love to keep whatever went on back then completely under wraps and just forget that it ever happened. Sounds to me like something potentially sketchy might have been going on with the church that they don't want us to know about. And finally, number one on this list is Pope John Paul I. This is one of the biggest scandals to rock the church and the Vatican and something that they're more than happy to keep under wraps. The Week writes, In The Godfather Part 3, a shady deal between the Mafia and the Vatican leads to the murder of the Pope. Was this based on a true story? Possibly. On the morning of September 28, 1978, Pope John Paul I was found dead sitting up in his bed after only 33 days in office. Although Vatican officials claimed the 65-year-old Pope died of a heart attack, there was never an autopsy and at the time the Vatican definitely had ties to organized crime. Sure enough, in 1982, Vatican Bank President Father Paul Marinkis resigned from his post after a series of scandals exposed the bank's ties to the Mafia. Eventually, the bank had to repay more than $200 million to its creditors. But Marinkis was never indicted of a crime, and though he was suspected of being involved in several mysterious deaths, including Pope John Paul I, Marinkis successfully claimed diplomatic immunity in the United States and retired to Arizona in 1990 and died there 16 years later. Until I started really digging into potential church secrets, I never had any idea that they had ties to the Mafia. This is because they've tried to cover it up as much as possible. 
Now, you might be thinking in this example specifically that the fact that they neglected to do an autopsy is evidence of something. Like the church knew that they would find something that they didn't want to be revealed. But the truth is, they never do an autopsy on the Pope. It's believed that performing an autopsy on the Pope will taint the body in some way and that it will make it harder to get into heaven. The body must remain clean and untampered within its path to God. This is all fine and good, but it means that you get instances like this where this person potentially got murdered and no one will be able to prove it. It's also really hard to get anywhere with the higher ups of this organization because oftentimes they just claim diplomatic immunity. It's widely believed now that the Vatican was at one point deeply involved with the Mafia and might even still be. They have way more money than anyone thinks that they should have and this money didn't just appear out of thin air. It's possible that their ties with the Mafia in this case even caused a murder. Number 5. Oliver Plunkett's Head Now in the other two videos, we talked about the head of St. Catherine of Siena and we also talked about St. John the Baptist and how many heads he may or may not have had scattered across the world and I'm not one to break tradition so I thought for part 3 I would include a third holy saintly severed head, this time belonging to Oliver Plunkett. A notable difference between the two other severed heads is that this one is probably the most disgusting one we've included on these lists. I know these are all holy relics, but let me just say, out of context, this is absolutely horrifying and looks like it's straight out of a grind host horror movie that you'd find in a, a dirty basket somewhere. <laughs> Oliver Plunkett, before becoming a head, was an Irish Catholic Archbishop who was a victim of the Popish plot. Now if you're not up to date on your Catholicism, that's a whole other video worth of explaining. I don't know much about the Popish plot, I'm not the guy to do that for you. But the short version is that it was a conspiracy falsely alleging that there was a plot against the Protestant King Charles II. Oliver Plunkett happened to end up on the receiving end of something really bad. Uh, namely, he was executed, which is pretty bad. But they really went out of their way to destroy Oliver Plunkett, his public image, his body. They called his praising of the Roman Catholic Church high treason. And his punishment was a slow and arduous death. He was hung, drawn, and finally quartered. Uh, and just in case there were any odds of him pulling through on a miraculous recovery, as a final author, they yeeted his head into a fire where it was rescued by a friend of Plunkett. I'd like to think I would do that for my friends. Well, after being recovered, the head was rescued and stored hidden away in a nunnery, eventually brought to Ireland in 1995, where he's now kept on display in the National Shrine to the Saint. He was canonized for his troubles, and he is the first new Irish saint in about 700 years. It's high time for some new blood, I think. So. You can go, you can pay your respects to him, and maybe offer him some skin cream, because uh, that skin's looking a little dry. And if you're looking for more creepy videos on weird relics or all sorts of strange things, Top 5 Scary has all of that and then some. If there's something scary, the odds are pretty good we've got a video or two on it. And if you haven't already, subscribe, hit that bell for more videos every single day, but do that at the end of this video, okay? We got way more weird Catholic relics coming up for you. Number 4. St. Teresa's Hand Now if you've watched our other videos on this subject, then no doubt you're already very familiar with the practice of making remnants of saints into relics. Now something that's directly from a saint is called a first class relic. That means it's something that came off of their body, you know? Uh, their hair, their fingernails, a vial of their fluids, or in the case of the lovely Saint Teresa, her whole hand. Encased in a beautiful ornate golden reliquary with gems all over the knuckles and the editors are goofing off because that's just a picture of the Infinity Gauntlet from Avengers Endgame. Wait, that, that's the real, that's what it really looks like. Yeah, it seems that Marvel Studios was more than inspired by the incorruptible Saint Teresa's hand when designing the weapon that would give Thanos the power to wipe out half the universe. Throw a comparison pick of them side by side, they're almost indistinguishable. I'm not 100% certain if there's any symbolism or connection there, but I'm sure Saint Teresa would love to know she was involved. She was a huge fan of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and all the things they do. When Saint Teresa of Avila passed away, the sisters of her convent buried her with the hopes of of keeping her holy body with them. Nine months later, she was exhumed, only to discover that her body was intact. 
and she hadn't decayed at all. That's why they thought she was incorruptible. Now, I'm not sure I totally follow the logic here, but after they discovered her body was incorruptible, they uh, took her hand off and put it into this golden infinity gauntlet thing as a way of inviting people to get closer to God through the saint's body. Now, this might not seem appealing to you, but there's a surprising demand for this relic. Near the end of the Spanish Civil War, General Francisco Franco had the hand removed from the convent and allegedly kept it close by, and if some of the wilder rumors are true, he would keep it by his pillow for good luck. You really gotta hand it to him. He was a devout follower of the faith. Today, you can find the hand in Iglesia de Nuestra Señora de la Merced in Ronda, Andalusia, and you don't even have to rip a stone out of the vision's forehead to get a good look at this gauntlet. Number three on this list is Egg Hill Church. This church was home to one of the worst tragedies a church has ever been host to. I've never been a real churchgoer myself, but from my understanding, love, life, spirituality, all of this is supposed to be in the air when you go and the whole reason for doing so. Death and hate and violence, that's all supposed to be left at the door. Pennsylvania's Egg Hill Church didn't quite do that. Instead, they invited death into the church on one particular Halloween night. Many years ago, the whole community gathered into the church on Halloween. The priest passed around bread and wine as is customary, but this bread and wine was a little off. In fact, it was very off. So off that everyone who had it died. It was poisoned. It's unknown whether the town had collectively decided to end their lives together that night or if this was all the priests doing, but either way, tens to hundreds of people's bodies lay lifeless on the ground when it was all said and done. Now, what are we left with? Well, the ghosts of all of these people, obviously. Even worse than that, the spirit of this evil priest still lingers here too, and apparently, he isn't done with the living. He's said to be very dangerous and wants to drag visitors down with him and take their life. This whole story is pretty much as dark as you can get, and it's no wonder the place is totally messed up today. Number two on this list is St. Nicholas Church. Hey, it's me. It just so happens that my church is haunted by a dozen spirits. Great. List first says, St. Nicholas Church is practically haunted by default. That's because the village of Pluckley, its home, is reputably the most haunted locale in all of England. The Kent village is home to the Watercress woman, who occupies the Pinnock Bridge and to the ghost of a schoolmaster who committed in front of his pupils. According to a conservative estimate, Pluckley contains no fewer than 12 active spirits. The church itself is said to be the home of both the beautiful ghost of Lady Daring and the Lady in Red, a ghost who searches the adjacent churchyard for her lost baby. The ghost of a former miller who worked in the area is also said to haunt the churchyard in search of a long lost love. Also, the ghost of a monk at nearby Greystone's house is also said to be seen during the night. Finally, visitors to St. Nicholas have reported seeing lights in the church's windows when no one was inside. So we have another church with just a plethora of horrible things. Someone taking their own life, a missing ch a man who has lost his loved one. My question is, why did all of this happen at this one church? Like what really caused all of this to transpire in the first place? Are we just supposed to believe that it's all coincidence or is there actually something more afoot here? I think that's the real secret and sadly, I don't know if we're ever gonna be able to find the true answer. And finally, number one on this list is Saint Andres on the Red. Just that name alone on the red. Like, of course this place had to have some dark secrets. List first says, St. Andrews on the Red, completed in 1849, is located in the town of Selkirk, which is more or less a suburb of Winnipeg. It's the oldest stone church in Western Canada, and it may be the region's most haunted, thanks to the spirits of former plague victims. Other apparitions are said to populate the church's graveyard. Eyewitnesses have reported seeing a ghostly man clad in black and a mysterious woman in white. Also, a disembodied pair of red eyes have startled the visitors in the past, while a ghost car has been noted not far from the church's main entrance. If you're thinking about visiting the church or graveyard, be wary. Those who've claimed to have seen the various apparitions also reported having terrible nightmares the following nights. 
gates. Most of these nightmares apparently involved the gates of the cemetery, which rattle even though no hands are seen shaking them. Some people can't shake these nightmares either. The occasional individual will have these persist for months or even years. I'm sure that the architecture and natural beauty is nice and all, but I'm not trying to risk nightmares for a year to see it. I do wonder what happened to those gates though. Is it some weird thing with the wind that's causing it, or is it what people suggest, some type of ghostly intervention? I tend to think some sort of spirit has to be involved, considering the thing with the nightmares happens as well, but you gotta wonder who. Sometimes I really do think that being a paranormal investigator would be awesome, because you could get to the bottom of these things, but then again, that's a pretty unforgiving profession. Number five on this list is Halstatt Karner. Halstatt Karner is one weird church man, let me tell you. I'm all about unique and cool decorations, but human body parts? <sighs> Kind of where I draw the line, guys. Discovery.com says, Many bone churches and ossuaries are decorated with femurs and pelvises, but at Halstatt Karner, these skulls themselves are decorated. More than 600 of the skulls on display in this Ben House, also known as Bone House in English, bear their former owners' names, professions, and the date of their death. Many are also adorned with decorative garlands and flowers. But perhaps what makes this bone church stand out the most is the fact that the most recent remains to be interred here belong to a woman who passed away in 1983 after having requested the Ben House as her final resting place. What's more, she might not be the last because the church is still open to receiving similar requests. So yeah, the dark secret here is that there is literal bones still being added. 1983 is really not that long ago when you think about it, and like the article suggests, that's probably not the last person to have been thrown into this array of skeletons. I guess it isn't, but it feels like this should be illegal or something. At the very least, it's just super weird. Like, why is a bunch of dead bodies and bones and stuff bringing anyone closer to God? Isn't the whole point of church to connect with your spiritual side? Not get grossed out by a bunch of dead people who you might have even known at one point. The church is located in Austria and has got to be one of the scariest churches in that country for sure. Unless you want your bones to be added to some religious display, I would stay away from this place. Number four on this list is the St. Louis Cathedral, a beautiful church like many on this list, which is riddled with spirits. List first says, like the city it serves, the St. Louis Cathedral in New Orleans is a font of strange myths and legends. Originally built by the city's French rulers, the modern cathedral wasn't completed until the 1850s. According to lore, the ghosts of the old structure came along for the ride. One of the cathedral's better known ghosts, Père Dagobert, was an 18th century priest. Dagobert was renowned for his kindness, especially his willingness to treat the poor and terminal ill. During the 1760s, several members of his congregation decided to revolt against the city's new Spanish rulers. The mainly French and Creole rebels successfully pushed the initial Spanish force out of the city, but a larger force later managed to claim New Orleans for the Spanish king. Infuriated by the earlier rebellion, Irish-Spanish governor Alejandro O'Reilly decided to not only execute the rebels, but also leave their rotting bodies on the doorstep of of the St. Louis Cathedral. As a devout Catholic, Degobert could not stand by while Catholic bodies were so roughly treated. After failing to get O'Reilly's permission to properly bury the bodies, Degobert led a funeral procession down to St. Peter's Cemetery and placed the slain men in unmarked graves. Degobert's successor, a Spanish priest named Pierre Antoine, is also said to haunt the cathedral. More intriguingly, Antoine's friend, voodoo priestess Mary Laveau, who often prayed at the church during her lifetime is also considered to be one of the many spirits inside the cathedral. So we got voodoo priestesses, unmarked haunted graves, multiple spirits of bodies that were buried improperly. This church is just one big mess. Many people think that there are also a bunch of other secrets that this place has that we don't know about. Like this was a spot for a secret society hundreds of years ago who performed some very questionable rituals and that's why this place is as haunted as it is. Whatever really happened here, we know it was dark and we know that it left its mark. 
In third place, we have the Vatican Bank. So formerly known as the Institute for the Works of Religion, the Institute, or the IOR for short, it was founded in June of 1942 by papal decree of Pope Pius XII. So uh, anyone want to guess when they presented their first public operations report? Come on, give it a try. Nope, not anywhere in the 1900s. 2013. Yep, that's what I said. 70 years later, they produced their first, uh, annual report. You know, the thing that's supposed to be held every year. Previous to all this, all internal ledgers were destroyed every 10 years in accordance with their policy. So the IOR's rule is to safeguard and administer property intended for works of religion or charity. And the bank accepts deposits only from top church officials and entities, and is run by a president, but overseen by five cardinals who report directly to the Vatican and the Vatican Secretary of State. So they only report to themselves. For reference, all banks that operate here in Canada have to report to the Minister of Finance. Just saying. Former bank president Atore Tateshi and the Vatican Bank have been investigated on two separate occasions for money laundering. In March of 2012, JP Morgan Chase closed a Vatican account in Milan after the IOR was unable to respond to questionable money transfers. In 2010, Italian authorities seized 30 million from a Vatican account at Italy's Credito Artigano Spa, following allegations that the IOR violated anti money laundering laws. Now, Everybody denied wrongdoing, and no charges were ever filed. The money was released after the IOR promised to pass measures to come into full compliance with international standards on money laundering and terrorism financing. In September 2019, German Cardinal Reinhard Marx, who was in charge of the Vatican's Economic Council, confirmed that Pope Francis had instructed him to reduce costs in an effort to eliminate a deficit that is estimated to be around 70 million euros. Don't get excited though, that's not a concrete number from them because, you know, that would be way too transparent. The exact amount is up for debate because the Vatican had not published a budget since 2015 and has been without an in-house auditor for two years or more. And uh, pardon me while I'm going to blink real slowly here. The Vatican enjoys a property tax break for all non-commercial properties containing a chapel. So using this loophole, between the years 2006 to 2011, the Vatican evaded taxes that amounted to 4 billion euros. The European Court of Justice ruled this illegal and the Vatican had to cough up those uh, euros as tax. Because you know, every kind of organization has that money lying around. And no, the Vatican did not entirely pay for evading taxes. It is argued that if you take into account the taxes that they evaded dating back to let's say 1992, they would owe over 13 billion euros. Yeah, I'm moving on before my eye twitch gets worse. In second place, we have the Chronovisor. No, this isn't some weird, you know, hat or goggles. Italian Benedictine monk Pellegrino Ernetti claimed to have used a time viewer which could film the past without sound and used it to obtain a photograph of the crucifixion of Jesus and view scenes from ancient Rome, including a performance of a very lost play. Now, this was mostly scrubbed away in history until like 2002 when author Father Francois Bru swore in his book, Le Nouveau Mystère du Vatican, that the chronovisor not only exists, but he learned about it in the early 1960s, a day after he met scientist priest Father Pellegrino. For the first time, the two were sailing along the Grand Canal of Venice discussing biblical interpretations when uh, the father explained that theories and interpretations were unnecessary when one could see the truth for himself. So he explained to our lovely author how the chronovisor functioned, allowing the viewer to both see and hear events of the past and future. And hey! If you don't believe my word, his full account is in that book I mentioned earlier. So with a little digging, researchers will find first mentions of the chronovisor in a 1972 article published in the Italian magazine La Domenica del Corriere entitled, A Machine That Photographs the Past Has Finally Been Invented. Belongs to the Vatican, and this chronovisor time machine is heralded as one of the papacy's best kept secrets. It's said to be replete with three precious alloys, cathodes, dials, levers, and has the ability to display myriad historic events in biblical and Roman history. So appear Apparently, since it acts as some sort of television, it can verify all of this. Now, this time machine is claimed to have been invented in the 1950s by a dedicated and secret team of Italian scientists, including who I've already mentioned, Mr. Pellegrino himself. Critics may take credibility issues with the fact that he, you know, eventually became a priest, but he was a scientist first. See, this critic doesn't take issue with that, more so that the Vatican is hiding a tool that could be used to help solve, you know, unanswered crimes around the world and maybe help people. Like imagine how many killings could be solved and how many families of lost people could have answers. Stop being selfish. In first place, we have the allegations from Arise Church. So an external review of Arise Church has called for its entire board to resign after reports from more than 500 current and former members, you know, that include allegations of 
cult-like behavior, racism, essay, and conversion therapy came to light. So that report, compiled by a group called Pathfinding, which is, you know, a consultancy firm for charitable organizations, was leaked to journalist David Ferrier, who revealed pretty damning allegations. The report was filled with experiences of, like I said, so many people involved with the church, which received nearly 15 million in donations the year before it was released. A 34-page summary of the investigation concluded it was undeniable that there had been significant hurts caused to people involved with a rise and egregious and systemic failures in governance over many years. And, uh, yeah, call for the board members to get the heck out. Arise Church senior pastor John Cameron did resign from his role following all these allegations, and Brent Cameron, pastor and brother of John, also resigned from his position around the same time. In a statement on its website, Arise said it was committed to safely share the stories of those who had participated and the report had been illegally obtained. Sure, whatever you say. The Pathfinding Report recommended a full independent review of the church's finances, including, you know, how donations tagged for certain purposes are used in reality, and a review of policies around expenditure limits for senior leadership. It also recommended disallowing tithing by younglings, and for those who are unaware, it means giving a percentage of your earnings. There was pressure to donate money, and some felt pretty uncomfortable about comments made about their donations. And oh no, ah. Uh, I wish I could swear right now. Underage people should not have to give a percentage of their earnings to anything if they're working. In total, 545 people completed submissions for the review, including folks from every campus across the country, past and present ministry school students, current and former members, staff, and past board members. They revealed harmful practices that had continued up until present day, and a very significant number of people had experiences that caused pain and hurt. A review found racist remarks were said from those preaching on the stage, with some staff being told to focus on white kids. When troubling behavior was experienced by members, they felt unable to speak up due to the pressure to say yes and please senior leaders amid an honor culture that had a strong focus on leadership rather than Jesus. This culture created favoritism among members, and uh, leaders sometimes used derogatory nicknames over a period of months for some individuals. So the reviewers heard from people who were pressured to continue working despite illness or serious injuries, including broken bones and concussions, and the dangers people faced driving through the night on no sleep to meet expectations, and operating heavy machinery after 17 hours of duty. Review Viewers heard reports of people at the church who were part of the LGBTQI community being subjected to conversion therapy and denied opportunities to serve because of their sin. And when I tell y'all I almost burst into tears when I first read that, as an openly bisexual woman, in today's day and age, I just want to scream whenever someone claims sexuality other than heteronormativity is an abomination or a choice that could be changed. People are born this way and that's their lives. Let them be. It's not going to hurt your existence. Arise Church has reported a loss of almost 2.8 million and after all of the above came out last year, I couldn't be happier. The average number of people at physical Sunday services fell from 4,000 people to under 3,000, and virtual services were attended by an average of 700 people, down from over 1,000. Numbers also fell across the church's programs for children, which went down, you know, 28%, and uh, young people, which was down 62%. Good riddance. Number five, St. Catherine's Head. Coming up first on our list of strange artifacts that the Catholic Church has hidden away is the severed, mummified head of the revered St. Catherine of Siena. Now you wouldn't really expect there to be a severed head kept out on display, but it is an important head I've come to understand. When she was young, St. Catherine had a vision of Jesus on a throne surrounded by saints. Afterwards, she devoted her life to Catholicism and she gave herself to the nunnery, cut her hair, scalded herself, and took a vow of celibacy. At 28, Catherine was said to have received the stigmata when five red rays shot out of the crucifix she was praying to and pierced her hands, her feet, and her heart. But these were far from the only miracles attributed to the lovely Saint Catherine, however. She was said to be seen levitating once during prayer, and even once a priest said he saw a holy communion fly from his hand directly into her mouth. Now, I will be honest, that does make her sound a bit like a saintly golden retriever, but okay. Catherine would pass at the young age of 33 and would be canonized a century later. If you don't know, that's a fancy word for being made into a saint post-mortem. While she passed in Rome, there was some disagreement as to where the young saint should be laid to rest eternally. Her hometown of Siena quite wanted her body back. Her spiritual leader, Raymond of Capua, knew he wouldn't really be able to smuggle her entire body past guards in Rome, so he elected to just uh, take her head in a bag, which normally would be terrifying behavior 
but it's good here. The story goes that when the guards intercepted Raymond, he prayed to Catherine, and when they looked inside his sack, they found naught but a collection of rose petals and not a severed head. Her final miracle. Now the head was placed in a relic, a reliquary. That's a difficult word to say, especially on a teleprompter. The head was placed in a reliquary where it still remains today, and you can go and pray to it. And I promise it's not gonna blink or anything at you, even though it looks like it just might. And if you're looking for way more stories of creepy relics locked away, haunted object, cursed things, cryptids, conspiracies, aliens, the whole scary nine yards, Top 5 Scary has all of that and then some. So hit that little bell, hit subscribe, and make sure you do not miss a single thing. Do it after this video, okay? We got way more creepy things locked away coming up for you right now. Number 4, The Grand Grimoire. Our next entry has been formally referred to as the Gospel of Satan, and is said to be a cursed book whose knowledge had to be sealed away to protect humanity. So this might be the most deadly book ever published after Hop on Pop. The Grand Grimoire, who is said to have been penned by a priest in the 16th century, who was possessed by a litany of demons who compelled the man to put their knowledge to paper. Acting as a scribe for these demons, the man wrote everything they knew about dark incantations, spells, instructions on how to cast rituals, ways to bind a demon to you, to make it your little minion and do your bidding. Wait, a demon gave instructions on how it wants to be bound to a human? To serve humans? Freaky little demon. That's not all too. There is a step-by-step -step recipe for a little necromancy if you're down to dabble in some dark arts and make some bones dance to your rhythm. The book really covers all the fun stuff you have been told not to do. It's not just brimstone and hellfire neither. There's rituals to help manipulate luck, how to conduct a seance, and I actually think this is adorable. There's even ways to make people love you in there. But dating tip from old Tay, uh, if you need a demon's help to make them like you, it might not be the strongest relationship. So, just a heads up. Now, if all of this is sounding super appealing, and I don't blame you, I played a necromancer in Skyrim, I want to make the bones raise, just know that this book is considered high treason. Even so much as cracking the spine is considered, is considered equivalent to selling your soul. So, you know, maybe hold off on that Amazon order for a bit. Also, I'm pretty sure the copy they're selling on Amazon is not the original, because due to the book's cursed reputation, the original copy is said to be locked away in the Vatican secret archives, and I'm sorry, but no matter how many times you ask, they're not gonna let you look at it, even if you swear you're just taking a little peek just to look at the illustrations and maybe the dedications. They're gonna keep it locked up. I know. Number three, the Veil of Veronica. Now on these lists of holy relics, we've had all sorts of strange things. We've had fingernails, teeth, dried up hands, we got milk coming up later. All things that have come from the body. Well, this next one is no different. It's the Veil of Veronica. And to put it gently, it's a sweat rag that's a few thousand years old. Probably one of the most pungent odors on the planet. Imagine every gym locker room you've ever been in times a thousand. When Jesus carried the cross, bruised and beaten, there was one person among the crowds who saw fit to help him out a little. Veronica wiped Jesus' face with this rag, and miraculously his face transferred onto the rag like it was silly putty on the funny papers. Now as an outsider, I thought this is what the Shroud of Turin was. That was the wrapping used to wrap Jesus after his death, so the thing I'm learning is that Jesus left an imprint of his face on just about any surface he touched. You give him a hug, have his face on the shoulder of your shirt for the rest of your life is a sacred artifact. Now, the Veil of Veronica is hard to nail down hard, concrete facts on. It's never been officially canonized as a relic of the church, and is only alleged to exist. It's claimed to be owned at St. Peter's in Rome, although this particular relic is not on public display anywhere. Probably for the best. Honestly don't know if I want to see a 2,000 year old sweat stain, the ones underneath my shirts are bad enough. Now it might sound like I'm being disparaging, referring to this relic multiple times as a sweat rag or a sweat stain, but I would like to offer this. The Latin name for the veil is Sudarium. Sudarium literally translates to sweat cloth, so even the official churchly terminology for this relic acknowledges that it's just a stinky rag that has some sweat on it, but a holy stinky rag that has some sweat on it. Number two, Mother Mary's Milk. We're gonna do our best to get through this, I promise. Mother's Milk might be my favorite Red Hot Chili Peppers album, it's my favorite character on The Boys, and it might just be one of the oddest relics on a series of odd relics that's all the way to part three. Took a lot of restraint to not put this in the first two, but we're on part three, so here it is now. As incredibly odd as it may sound, the Virgin Mary's Milk is considered a relic of the Catholic Church. I, I hope they They've been keeping that in the fridge. 
lest it spoils. Does, does holy milk spoil? Is everything I've said in this video profoundly heretical? There is a church called the Church of Milk Grotto built outside Bethlehem. The history goes that the Madonna and child had taken refuge in this cave, and while she was feeding, milk spilled outwards and blessed the stone of the cave, turning it completely white. Now the church serves as a popular shrine for women who are struggling with fertility, who hope that the lasting aura and presence of the Virgin Mary will bless them. There is a legend that goes with it. Saint Bernard, the saint, not the big dog that has his tongue hanging out, was devoted to the Mother Mary. And one day he was praying at a statue of the Madonna, and he asked it to give him some sign, some proof that she was a mother. I guess the statue has like an odd sense of humor because it sprayed milk onto Saint Bernard. Uh, depending on the variation of the story, either his eye or in his mouth, I saw a lot of, of really interesting paintings depicting this scene. And editors, I hope you're having so much fun trying to find photos for this one. I am so sorry. Truly, rest in peace, your search history. In the Middle Ages, vials of the milk were sold and transported all over Europe. For what purpose, I could not tell you. These days, the Church of Milk Grotto sells a limestone powder made from the stone walls of the grotto, meant to be dissolved in a drink and consumed. Uh, kind of like crystal light, but it's holy milk. Probably heals all that ails, and it's a good source of calcium, perhaps. And number one, the holy prep use. This is gonna be the one that takes the channel down. You have no idea the restraint it's taken me to, to only be bringing this up now in part three of, of Strange Relics. This is probably the strangest relic of them all. We'll do our best to discuss this with reverence and also somehow figure out how to stay within content guidelines. Editors, best of luck. When Jesus was born, on his eighth day, uh, a small piece of his skin was removed in a traditional ritual performed on Jewish men when they're born. Okay, are you, are you sort of following along with what I'm saying here? This particular part of the body that I can't quite mention that was removed at birth was an immensely holy relic to the Catholic Church called the Holy Prepuce. Now the very bizarre part regarding the history of the Holy Prepuce isn't just that it exists at all, it's how much trouble one bit of skin would cause. You see, the prepuce first pops up in the year 800, when Charlemagne gave it to Pope Leo III on December 25th, making it one of the oddest Christmas gifts ever given in human history. From here, it stayed until 1527. Now, when Rome was sacked, a German soldier stole the prepuce and tried to keep it for himself until it was eventually recovered again and became the centerpiece of the village of Calcutta, where it was seen as the most exciting thing to happen in a while. It was like a celebrity showed up to the village. It was this great, big, important deal. They had a part of the body of the Savior. All manner of miracles are reported to have been the result of the Holy Prepuce. However, Several other churches, villages, priests, all claimed that they had the true holy prepuce, and any other ones you might have heard of out there were false. This problem became rampant, and in the early 1900s, the church wanted to wash their hands of the holy prepuce entirely and outright forbade any discussion of it in church matters. It was actually an excommunicable offense to so much as bring up the prepuce. Meaning this video is pure heresy. In 1983, the prepuce was stolen from the church in Calcutta. Where is it now? Where did it go? Absolutely no one knows. No one's fessed up. You know, if you took it, I think now's a good time to just admit you did it. But if they're ever looking for a plot line for a third National Treasure movie, I have an absolutely amazing idea for something Nicolas Cage could steal. Number five, Benito Mussolini. Now, the Vatican isn't just the seat of the Catholic Church. Did you know that actually the Vatican is the smallest country in the world? Despite the fact that it does exist inside Rome, inside Italy, the Vatican technically is not part of Italy, but rather its own sovereign little country. About a thousand people live there total, but it hasn't always been this way. And the reason that it became that way is a little darker than I'm sure the church would like to admit. It was a treaty with fascist leader Benito Mussolini. In 1922, Mussolini and the National Fascist Party came to power in Italy, crushing democracy and putting up a pretty hostile dictatorship in its place. In 1929, Mussolini and the church 
came together to have a little meet and greet and sign a treaty, granting the church status as a private enclave, a sovereign state inside of Italy. Mussolini wouldn't bother the Vatican, and they wouldn't bother him. Mussolini even paid out a massive, massive settlement which the church invested and is believed to be valued at around 780 million US dollars. Alongside tax exemption and priests getting a nice salary from the Italian government. All of those benefits you can thank a fascist government for. Perhaps most illuminating however was a clause that protected the Vatican's dignity. Meaning as part of their laws as a sovereign state they were allowed to arrest and try anyone who criticized the people and the church. In exchange for signing this treaty, the Catholic Church publicly supported the fascist dictatorship and was recognized as Italy's official government. The Vatican's own newspaper printed shortly after the deal went down, Italy has been given back to God and God to Italy. And they only have the support of someone who is involved in hundreds of thousands of deaths to thank. And if you're looking for way more strange true things out of history, conspiracies about the Catholic Church, cryptids, aliens, and all sorts of freaky business. Top 5 Scary has all of that and then some. So click on through, hit subscribe, please make sure to hit that bell so you get everything and do not miss a single screen. But you do that at the end of this video, okay? We got way more Catholic Church secrets coming up. Number 4, the treacherous Pope Boniface. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. This idea being that none of us are truly free of sin and we're all born into this world natural sinners. Well, some people really take that idea and really run with it. And you would be surprised how high up the Catholic Church some of these troublemakers get. That's where Pope Boniface VII comes in, one of history's most notorious popes for his incredibly unholy behavior. Pope Boniface was actually so wildly controversial that Dante Alighieri wrote in the Inferno that Pope Boniface was condemned to the eighth circle of hell where the frauds were kept. It's a really good window into the sort of general mindset of the population that in their books they were imagining all the ways he'd be tormented in hell. And as a quick aside, for the comment section, Dante's Inferno, is that history's first fan fiction? There's a very serious argument to be made that it is. Anyway, Boniface saw the destruction of Palestrina, a city that had already peacefully surrendered and submitted, but that wasn't good enough for the church. Palestrina had already been burned to the ground, and goofy old Pope Boniface ordered that they plow it down to the dirt and soil to ensure that absolutely nothing of the city remained standing, a real salt of the earth approach. He was definitely a guy who loved his neighbors. He really loved his neighbors, in the sense that the, the vow of celibacy that men of the cloth have to swear to, Boniface didn't really like believe in at all. He was alleged to engage in all kinds of parties with all manner of bedroom companions, having once stated that he felt intercourse with younger people was as natural as hands rubbing together. A really, really great guy all together, and he also loved building statues of himself all the time, so he was very prideful, which that, that's the worst sin of them all. Really. Number 3, Hyacinth of Caesarea. Our next entry is the bones of Hyacinth of Caesarea, another Catholic mummy. I'm starting to think there's more Catholic mummies than there were Egyptian ones. Incredibly ornate and gorgeous, the bones of Hyacinth look like something out of one of the Indiana Jones sequels rather than like a real thing you can go and see, but I I promise you they are totally extant. On the grounds of the Furstenfeld Abbey reside the relics of two saints. Now these aren't just like a toenail or a tongue and more on that later, but these are full on science class skeletons dressed to the nine in gold and jewels, encrusted in more diamonds and rubies than you could imagine. They are probably worth more than your and my apartments combined. Old Hyacinth. Heisey, as he liked to be called by his friends, was an obscure martyr from the early days of Christianity, slain by the Romans for his faith. We know precious little about him today, but we know that his name appears in a list of martyrs from the 4th century, which suggests that he used to be pretty important, and he was popular enough to write his name down on a list, much like what I'm doing right now. Look at how history repeats itself like that, isn't that fascinating? Now Hyacinth's skeleton showed up at the Church of the Assumption in, uh, I'm going to excuse the pronunciation here, Furstenfeldbruck near Munich at an unknown date. Did somebody just dropped him off, somebody just dumped a bag of bones on the front step like he's a baby you're giving up for adoption at the fire station? No more questions. The church was sacked by the Swedish army in the 17th century, and when it was rebuilt they really went all out. 
out with the decor. Going over the top, a little buttock, including a skeleton decked out in bling, looking like he is about to take over the skeleton rap scene. So that's Hyacinth. Largely not remembered in life for any particular reason beyond being slain for his religion and remembered forever as a ludicrously swagged out skeleton. We can all only hope for similar legacies as Dear Sweet Hyacinth. Number two, the tongue of Saint Padilla. Did you know your tongue is made up of eight muscles? Maybe you didn't. Did you know that one of the most important relics to the Catholic Church is a dried up 8,000 year old tongue that looks like beef jerky kept inside a golden helmet that looks like something out of a dark fantasy 80s movie? Well now you do. And have you enjoyed how much of this list is mummified bodies in gold? Because I have. Saint Anthony was said to be a jewel case of the Bible, making a name for himself with his apparently extremely inspirational sermons that won the Catholic Church many new members. People would flock in just to hear what Saint Anthony was talking about. Apparently he even got a bunch of ex-Christians to reform and rejoin the faith. He was apparently an incredibly accomplished public speaker and I would say that he had a silver tongue but we actually have proof of what color his tongue was because it's kept in a little glass jar. Saint Anthony would pass away in 1231 from edema, a horrible disease that causes a buildup and blockage of fluid in the body's tissues. Now some 30 years later in 1263 he was exhumed and shocking the grave diggers who were doing it. While his body had rotted and decomposed, his legendary tongue was still intact, as incorruptible as it had been in life, allegedly still wet with saliva. I wonder if he could still taste. Seeing it was a miracle, the gravediggers took his tongue alongside the bottom half of his jaw, and they are both displayed in the Basilica of St. Anthony of Padua in elaborate gold reliquaries. But honestly, it looks like something straight out of Warhammer 40k. Does no one think this is as odd as I do? Maybe I'm an outsider, I didn't grow up terribly Catholic, so I don't really know these imagery. I know the story behind it isn't terribly scary, but the image of this tongue and jaw inside a little glass helmet wrapped in gold looks like something I would ask an AI to make if I typed in nightmare. A tongue shouldn't look like that. <laughs> and I feel like a jaw shouldn't look like that either. Am I alone in this? Am I weird for thinking this is weird? You let me know down below in the comments if maybe I just lack context on all of this. And number one, Camilus de Lelis' heart. Camilus de Lelis was a man with a big heart full of love, never ending in generosity. We know just how big his heart is because it is kept in a glass jar and it is salted to preserve its legacy. Whoa. Camilla started out pretty humble, born in 16th century Naples. He would later become a soldier until a brutal gambling problem would end up overtaking his life, leaving him in rags driving a donkey cart, but he knew that a far better life was out there. Eventually, he was urged by a friar to explore the lighter side of his soul, and eventually someone was able to pierce his heart both figuratively and later literally, and persuaded him into seeking divine retribution. Camillus would devote his life to providing for the ailing, but tragically and perhaps unsurprisingly if you spent all your time around sick people before modern medicine, a lifetime of caring for the sick led to him also becoming gravely ill, soaking up a litany of ailments including a sore in his leg for 46 years, a rupture for 38 years, two callous sores in the sole of a foot, violent nephritic colics, intense kidney pain, and for a long time a loss of appetite. Now all of these things, working in tandem, would eventually claim Camillus, a man who gave his life to healing the sick. So post-mortem he was canonized and thought of as the patron saint of the sick. And what better way, I ask, to venerate a man famous for his ever giving heart than to cut his heart out like he was in the temple of doom and start salting his heart like it was beef jerky. You can go to St. Mary Magdalene's church in Rome to go see if his heart, you know, put a stethoscope up to it, check if it's still beating, but it's pretty dried up and tucked away behind glass where you can go and pay your respects and see if it has any life left to bestow and maybe if it'll help you out with an illness at all. Number five, Hans Schmidt. I think all of us, we want to be remembered for something amazing someday, right? That's only human. For walking on the moon, for writing the great American novel. Me? I want to be remembered for being a slightly above average YouTube host for spooky internet comment. Well, Hans Schmidt, a German priest, he certainly remembered and found himself a legacy when he became the only Roman Catholic priest in American history to face the death sentence. They, they probably didn't put that on his tombstone or anything though. 
They say that you can see the signs of darkness from a very early age. Schmidt had wanted to be a priest since an early age, funny enough, but he was also routinely caught killing animals and drinking the fluids that were inside and would apparently spend most of his youth at the slaughterhouse. And also his Wikipedia page mentions that he had a collection of severed geese heads that he put in his pockets. So yeah, maybe no, there, there were some warning signs and red flags here that people really were not paying attention to. By age 25, Hans Schmidt was ordained to be a priest and served over mass for four years in Germany before relocating to Louisiana. Schmidt got himself involved in some wild crimes, doing some unspeakable things that the church covered up for him. Wasn't that nice of them? And they once again found him on the move, and he was sent to Manhattan at St. Boniface Church. Here, Schmidt would meet with the love of his life, Anna A. Muller. He became immediately obsessed with her, claiming that it was God's will he fall in love with her. Oh my God, ladies, don't you just hate it when a guy pulls the old, oh, it's God's will, it's God's will. <laughs> All the time, eh? He began an affair with her and he held a secret wedding, vowing to leave the cloth with her. When a Muller became pregnant, Schmidt knew he would be outed for disobeying the oath of priesthood. So, being a reasonable thinking man of God, Schmidt's solution was to slit her throat and remove her limbs and throw it in the Hudson River and then went to mass the next day. Oh, no, that's actually not, not very priest-like at all. Schmidt was tried, convicted, and executed in Sing Sing Prison where, like I mentioned earlier, he remains the only American priest that's ever happened to. Although from what I've learned about the guy, I, I don't think anyone would complain too much that that happened. I don't know if this was a huge loss. And if you're looking for way more stories of creepy crawlies, ghosts, goblins, conspiracies, and basically anything freaky under the sun and above it that you can think up, hit subscribe for Top 5 Scary and don't miss a single scream. Make sure you hit that little bell, but do it at the end of this video if you wouldn't mind. Number four, Gerald Robinson. Hey, a little f hypothetical question. If you're a priest, how much Satanism are you allowed to dabble in? Pr probably not much, right? They, they probably would prefer that that be like as, as zero as possible. Gerald Robinson was a Catholic priest, but was living a double life, practicing satanic rituals in secret with horrifying consequence. In the 1980s, Robinson was the chaplain at Mercy Hospital in Toledo, where he ministered over the terminally ill. The caretaker of the chapel there was a nun named Sister Margaret Ann Powell, a kindly old woman. Shockingly and horrifyingly, Paul was killed after being stabbed 31 times, with nine times in a deliberate shape of an inverted cross and a smear across her forehead symbolizing a mockery of last rites. Police suspected someone was trying to humiliate Paul in death. Father Robinson was questioned, but not charged. A clergyman took Father Robinson out of his questioning and the case would freeze for nearly 30 years. Reports on the case would disappear and police believed there was a conspiracy of a cover-up. It wasn't until late in 2003 when police received a letter from a woman using the name Survivor Doe, claiming that she had suffered under the hands of Father Robinson, who had been assaulting women and practicing satanic rituals up to and including human sacrifice. With these new lofty allegations, authorities reopened the case and upon searching Robinson's apartment, discovered a sword-shaped letter opener that fit the wound in the nun's body like a key to a lock, according to prosecutors. What a what a charming turn of a phrase for a horrible thing. In 2006, Robinson was charged, and hopefully, Sister Paul was able to find some peace in the afterlife after such a mortifying ordeal. Number three, Galileo. Science and religion do have a place alongside one another in the world, I think. Now, science and religion have had a complicated history, you know, they never quite seen eye to eye, kind of always furrowing their brows and glaring at each other through the hallways, but one could never truly disprove wholly the existence of God through science, and I think science can illuminate and, and shine new light on, on ways to glorify religion, right? Maybe? Well, not particularly. As, as one could imagine, there's a great deal of difficulty the church has with science. In 1633, Galileo Galilei, the renowned astronomer, made himself an enemy of the Catholic Church and God for having the unbelievable, blasphemous, heretical viewpoint that the Earth orbits the Sun and not the other way around. Now, Galileo didn't quite have it all the way, since he did posit that the Sun is the center of the universe, and he wasn't super right about that, but hey, 
give the guy a little credit. He was doing all this before the TI-84, okay? He was just looking up in the sky making all these guesses. Pretty smart guy. He was doing better than most astronomers out there. Now for this most heinous, disgusting, unbelievably sinful crime, Galileo was arrested and put on trial where 10 cardinals sat before him passing judgment and trying to decide how best to punish this disgusting heretic, floating some fun ideas like imprisonment for life, torment, being burned at the stake. Again, this is all because Galileo suggested how the planets work, and he was mostly right about this, which is important to hammer home. Eventually, Galileo renounced his beliefs, saying he was wrong, and he was getting up there in age, and didn't want to spend the rest of his life suffering. So in an act of true humble forgiveness, the church instead decreed that instead of being burned or anything, Galileo be condemned to spend the rest of his days in his home, which he did until his passing. That'll teach him. Now eventually, obviously, the church kind of had to walk back some of that treatment of Galileo. In 1992, they spoke out saying that maybe he was kind of technically right about like a few things here and there and mumbled out an apology like a schoolyard bully being forced to say sorry by the teachers. Sure, it was about 350 years too late, but I bet Galileo probably really appreciated it and would have loved to have known how vindicated by history he would have been. Number two, the wild and wacky life of Pope Benedict the Ninth. Over the years, there have been many, many controversial popes. I mean, there's a bunch on this list already. In fact, you'd probably find more popes are wrapped in controversy than you might imagine. Now, it's pointless to compare sins on any sort of moral scale as to who's the most evil or, or the worst pope, but it's hard to argue that few of them got up to as much chaos and trouble as Pope Benedict IX, who was one of the wackiest, most notorious popes out there. He once sold the position because he got bored of it. It's said he began his pontification when he was a young, young man because his wealthy family just wanted it. And that was like a thing you could do back then. If you had enough money, you could just bribe the church and ask that your son become Pope. Benedict loved the lifestyle and behaved the way Joffrey Baratheon would, you know, kind of really letting the power get to his head almost immediately. He would spend his money on women of the night, hosting lecherous, wild, erotic parties, which allegedly would have all manner of man, woman, and if the stories are to be believed, animals as well. It was not long before there were conspiracies being drawn up to assassinate the Pope, if you can believe that. Even just saying that feels weird, but they wanted to assassinate the Pope. Probably in a case of divine intervention or, or fate, on a feast day, his enemies snuck into St. Peter's Basilica carrying rope, ready to tangle up the Pope. But a solar eclipse scared the assassins so badly they called the whole thing off, and to be honest, I totally get it. If I was planning on disposing the Pope and the sun got blocked out, I'd assume God was furious at me. Failed coups notwithstanding, Pope Benedict's reputation did not improve much. He was attacked by an angry mob in 1045, and he was forced to flee and would be replaced by another Pope, one Sylvester III. Two months later, however, Benedict would return to take the title back. But two months later, he decided that he didn't really enjoy being Pope anymore. It wasn't as fun, what with all the constant bombardment of hate and failed attempts on his life. So he sold it to his godfather for what amounted to nearly $30 million. Imagine buying the Pope. Imagine buying being the voice of God. Anyway, if you can believe it, like Emperor Palpatine, somehow Pope Benedict returned a third time. King Henry III of Germany had arrested Pope Sylvester III for being a false pope, and the godfather that he'd sold the throne to had given up the papacy, admitting that it was shameful and heretical for him to have ever done so in the first place. So Henry appointed a new German pope while Benedict was in hiding, and that pope mysteriously passed away eight months later from a poisoning which many historians suspect Benedict had his little fingers in. So Benedict came back for a third time to be the Pope, only this time no one was putting up with him. They'd been through this two more times, they weren't doing it again. Henry III sent troops to drag him out of the basilica. He spent his dying years in a monastery and is now remembered in history as one of the worst popes ever. And number one, the Pazzi Conspiracy. If you've garnered anything from this video that I've been telling you, I sincerely hope it's that the Pope doesn't always follow the rules. Sure, the guy interprets the will of God, you know, he's got a direct line to talking to him, but that doesn't mean he follows every single one of his rules. Now, we've already discussed some of the wildest sins that popes have been caught up in, but let's top it all off with a full-blown assassination conspiracy revolving around the Pope ordering a hitman. No, really. In the 1470s, Pope Sixtus IV hatched a scheme to rid Florence of the Medicis, the most influential family in the country at the time, 
time, rivaling the church. The Medicis had served as the bankers for the papacy for generations and as such were loaded. Pope Sixtus kickstarted this conflict when he changed the Medicis over as the bankers to the Pazzi family who were more loyal to him. The Medicis didn't want to pay to help the Pope claim the town of Imola which the Medicis themselves wanted to lord over. So with these in the way, the Pope thought that something had to be done about these meddling Medicis. So Sixtus contracted two assassins to carry out the plot against Lorenzo and Giuliano de Medici during Easter Mass on Sunday, which just feels unbelievably disrespectful if you're the Pope, you know? You can't talk in church, but you can orchestrate a political assassination. That's fine to do on Sunday, on Easter Sunday. Now, if you're sitting here listening to this and you're kind of scratching your head because you feel like all of this sounds a bit familiar, imagine you have a white hood on and you're jumping into a bale of hay because this was a driving plot line in Assassin's Creed 2 where protagonist Ezio ends up helping out Lorenzo Medici a great deal. Yeah, now the games were really inspired by true history, you know, save for a few extendo blades and boss fights against the Pope but a lot of that stuff really did happen. History is just as weird as the video games make it out to be. Now, if you remember from Assassin's Creed 2, Giuliano was fatally slain, but Lorenzo survived and rallied support of Florence in a war against the church. Lorenzo picked off conspirators and then sailed to Naples to meet King Ferdinand to discuss a peaceful solution to the bubbling war. There's a reason they called him Il Magnifico. This guy was great at strategy. In the end, the plot failed drastically because all it really did was cement people's support to Lorenzo Medici. People loved the fact that he survived an assassination. They made a medal commemorating this for him and it brought shame to Pope Sixtus and it inspired one of the best games Ubisoft ever put out. Coming in at number five, we have the Vatican Secret Archives. The Vatican Secret Archives is considered to be the world's most secure building, but why is it so locked down? What secrets are being hidden behind the walls? The amount of history located there is immense. The Vatican Secret Archives is home to the largest collection of Catholic books, documents and doctrine in the world. It boasts letters from well-known figures such as Abraham Lincoln and Mary Queen of Scots. It contains 53 miles of shelving with 35,000 volumes in the selective catalogue alone. The archives also include state papers, correspondence, account books, and many other documents the church has acquired over the centuries. Naturally, many people have speculated that there must be secret documents amongst the 50 plus miles of shelving in the Vatican's archives. Of course, no one is allowed to browse the archives, which makes it even more mysterious. Only select scholars, academics, and journalists are allowed to enter, and this is a rule that will never likely change. Many believe that the Pope and many people around him keep very classified and secret information in the archives that they don't want the world knowing. One theory is that the archives contains correspondence between Saint Paul and Emperor Nero, pertaining to Jesus' existence and his biological descendants. And some believe that the Vatican may be hiding proof that Jesus did in fact exist or didn't exist at all. Next is the confirmation and evidence of alien life forms such as extraterrestrial skulls. Some claim that in 1998, skulls with elongated heads and small faces resembling aliens were found underneath the Vatican. Ever since, the Vatican has kept all evidence of aliens a secret to not discredit Christianity. Another secret being held from the world is the Grand Grimoire, which is an alleged medieval book that is believed to possess immense powers. It was written in the 16th century by Honorius of Thebes, who claimed to be possessed by the devil himself. In the book, it has instructions on how to make magic talismans and amulets, how to make magic spells and even how to summon demons and even offers instructions on how to summon the devil himself and make a deal with him. If the Vatican is keeping world shattering secrets in its archives, we may never know due to its high level of security and it only being accessible to a slight few. So our questions of what is really in there may never be answered. In at number four, we have the Church of Rome, destruction of important Jewish historical documentation. In 1415, the Church of Rome took an extraordinary step to destroy all knowledge of the two second century Jewish books that is said contained the true name of Jesus Christ. The Antipope Benedict XIII firstly signaled out for condemnation a secret Latin treatise called Ma Yesu, and then issued instructions to destroy all of the copies of the Book of Alaxi. No editions of these writings now publicly exist, but church archives recorded that they were once in popular circulation and known to early presbyters. Knowledge of these writings survived from quotations made by Bishop Hippolyte.
Hippolytus of Rome and Saint Epiphanius of Salamis along with references in some early traditions of the Talmud of Palestine and Babylonia. The Rabbanic fraternity once held the destroyed manuscripts with great reference, for they were comprehensive original records reporting of the life of Rabbi Jesus. Later in a similar manner, Pope Alexander VI ordered all copies of Talmud destroyed. The Council of the Inquisition required as many Jewish writings as possible to burn with the Spanish Grand Inquisitor. Thomas de Torquemada, responsible for the elimination of 6,000 volumes at Salamanca. In 1550, Cardinal Carraf, the Inquisitor General, repealed all previous permission for priests to read the Talmud, which he said contained hostile stories about Jesus Christ, leading him to seize every copy he could find in Rome and burn them. Solomon Romano also burnt many thousands of Hebrew scrolls, and in 1559, every Hebrew book in the city of Prague was confiscated. The mass destruction of Jewish books included hundreds of copies of the Old Testament and caused irreversible loss of many original handwritten documents. The mass destruction of Jewish writings, the church overlooked two particular British documents that still exist to this day in the British Museum. Number three, Father Daniel Petra Corgano. When you take the cloth, you get called on for all sorts of things, marriages, funeral rites, confessions, and in the extreme cases, exorcisms, where you're the last line of spiritual defense against a demonic spirit that has taken host of someone else's body. Of course, exorcisms don't always go the way that you would hope. You know, sometimes a little pea soup gets fired across the room. Sometimes the person you're exercising accidentally dies from your neglect. You know, anything can happen, really. Father Daniel Petra Corgano believed that a member of his flock, a nun in the convent, one sister Marcia Corici, became the unwilling host to a demon that had moved in and paid first and last for rent inside her soul. Now, she was experiencing classical symptoms of schizophrenia, but Corgano believed it to be demonic possession. Sister Kornichi was bound at her ankles and wrists and given holy water to drink, which she threw up. I, I don't really blame her. I bet it probably tastes weird. Rather brutally after this, Sister Kornichi was bound to a cross and was gagged with a wet cloth soaked in holy water, which we already know she doesn't like the taste of. From here, she was cruelly subjected to a round-the-clock exercising over the course of three days. I cannot even imagine how mentally and physically taxing that was. Now, she wasn't fed during this time, nor were any of her medical needs tended to. And I don't know how much you know about like medical stuff or, or the human body, but you need food to live. Sister Cornici would unsurprisingly pass away from complications suffered during the exorcism, leaving this earth a free soul, if for nothing else. Now, Father Corgano would undergo investigation for his involvement in Cornici's death. He insisted that he was simply following following God's plan and that he was trying to cure her the way God intended and her death was a, an unfortunate accident and, and not his intention. Well, sure, you didn't kill her, but you did tie her to a cross and not feed her for three days, so you, you definitely helped. I don't know how to tell you. In the end, though, Sister Cornici's death was officially ruled to be caused by an overdose of adrenaline injections when she was taken into the hospital. Ah, okay, well that clears it up then. <laughs> Total accident. Number two, the wild and wacky life of Pope Benedict the Ninth. Over the years, there have been many controversial popes. In fact, I would bet you can probably find more popes wrapped in controversy than not. While it's kind of pointless to compare sins on a sort of moral scale, it's hard to argue that few popes got up to even half as much chaos and trouble as Pope Benedict the Ninth. So notorious, he once sold the position when he got bored of it. He was just done. He sold it. It said he began his pontification when he was a young, young man because his family wanted it. They just wanted it. They wanted him to be Pope. Benedict loved the lifestyle and behaved the way Joffrey Baratheon would, spending his money on women of the night, hosting lecherous, wild, erotic parties with all manner of man, woman, and apparently animals as well. He really was not picky. It wasn't long before there were conspiracies being drawn up to assassinate the Pope, if you can believe that. Imagine that. There were guys sitting around a table being like, hey, we gotta do something about the Pope. I think we have to assassinate him. Possibly in a case of divine intervention, his enemies on a feast day snuck into St. Peter's Basilica carrying rope ready to strangle Benedict, but a solar eclipse of the sun scared the assassin so badly they called the whole plan off. And fair, if I was planning to dispose of the Pope and then like five minutes beforehand I saw the sun get blackened out, I would assume God was gonna strike me down then and there. 
Failed coups notwithstanding, Pope Benedict's reputation did not improve much. He was attacked by an angry mob in 1045, forced to flee, and replaced by another pope, one Sylvester III. Two months later, though, Benedict would return to reclaim the title. And then two months again, he decided that honestly he wasn't really vibing with this pope business anymore, what with the constant bombardment uh, and attempts on his life, and sold it to his godfather for what amounted to nearly 30 million American dollars. Imagine buying the Pope. <laughs> Imagine the highest seat you can have in the Catholic Church and you bought it. <laughs> if you can believe it, like Emperor Palpatine, somehow Pope Benedict returned. They just could not get rid of this guy. King Henry III of Germany had arrested Pope Sylvester for being a false pope, and the godfather Benedict sold the throne to had given up the seat, admitting that it was wrong for him to buy being the pope. It was wrong to buy the papacy. I, I could have told you that. Henry appointed a new German pope while Benedict was in hiding, and then that pope passed away mysteriously eight months later after being poisoned, which many historians suspect Benedict had his little fingers in. So Benedict came back to be a pope for a third time, and no one was putting up with this. <laughs> Henry III sent troops to drag him out of the basilica, and he spent his dying years in a monastery where he is now remembered as one of the worst popes in history, but he sounds fun. <laughs> Number one, Oliver O'Grady. All of these people have been awful or downright embarrassing examples of priests, and yet Oliver O'Grady might be the worst of all of them. YouTube content guidelines really does not like for us to be discussing the kind of crimes that he committed, but I will say this, if I say a Catholic priest committed a crime, it's the first one that you're imagining right now. It's that one. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you might not be old enough to watch these videos. O'Grady began his career in the early 70s and committed innumerable, immoral, irredeemable acts on the most vulnerable members of his flock. By 1993, he was convicted and sentenced to a 14-year prison sentence and a $7 million settlement to the victims whose families and lives he'd ruined. However, and if, if you don't want your day ruined, pause this video, open up another tab, go watch a video of some like kittens playing or anything. Nothing good is about to happen here. He only served half that sentence. He served seven years and was then paroled and deported in Ireland. In 2005, a video deposition had O'Grady confessing to having had 25 victims. In 2006, a documentary made about Oliver O'Grady called Deliver Us From Evil focused on his crimes, but more importantly, how the Catholic Church pulled a nice big white rug over the horrific crimes he committed to protect their clergy. The documentary outlines how O'Grady preyed on his victims, how he committed his crimes, and how the church was very well aware of everything he was doing and swept it under the rug. In 2019, O'Grady was arrested again. Oh, I can't believe it. He seemed like such a good guy. This time for owning deeply illegal lewd content. O'Grady would find himself in jail again in 2020, sentenced to 22 months, which seems kind of like a slap on the wrist given the history, but what do I know? Generally, I think if they make documentaries about the crimes that you've committed, that should impact the sentence slightly. But again, I'm not a lawyer, I'm just a YouTube host, and I'm just Tay. Number five, a time machine. Among the many conspiracies about what goods are hidden inside the Vatican's secret archives, one of the more popular and reoccurring ones is that the Vatican has access to wondrous technology hidden away from the rest of the world, from ancient civilizations, stuff like that. One leading theory is that among these devices is something called the chronovisor, an alleged time machine of sorts that allows the user to peer inside and see whatever time period in history or forwards they desire, like a little time camera. Doctor Who would love it. One Italian monk, one Pellegrino Ernetti, claimed that he developed the chronovisor at some point during the 1950s with a team of 12 esteemed scientists who all wished to remain anonymous in the process. I would put my name on that if I invented time travel, personally. I'd want people to know. The chronovisor is described as consisting of antennas and uh, an unknown metal that's really good at looking through time, a little knob for tuning to a particular time and place, and a screen and recording device. Ernetti described that he and 
his team used this machine to view speeches by Mussolini and Napoleon, scenes from ancient Rome, and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, which they allegedly tried to take a photo of. Now, obviously, no one's seen the chronovisor. If such a device was to exist, it would naturally be pretty secretive. An Italian magazine in the 1970s claims that they found that image of Christ's crucifixion, the photo that was taken through time. <sighs> only to discover that it was actually just a postcard. So this one's a bit up in the air. Let me know if you think this is real, but also, you know what? Let me know what time period you would want to take a picture of, if you could see that up close. And if you're looking for way more scary content, my friends, my friends, you already know Top 5 Scary is the place to be. We've got everything scary under the sun. Cryptids, conspiracies, true crime, fake crime, aliens, UFOs, just about anything freaky you can think of. So click on through, subscribe, stay scared, and don't miss a single thing. But Keep watching this video too, okay? We worked hard on it. Number four, the three secrets of Fatima. Over a hundred years ago, three young people in Portugal from the town of Fatima claimed that they were visited by the Virgin Mary herself in a vision and the Madonna shared with them wondrous prophecies and visions onto them. These visions, allegedly, were the Second World War, the rise and fall of communism, and the death of a pope. And these were referred to as the three secrets of Fatima. Very cool prophecy stuff. Now. Story goes that the Madonna would visit these three shepherds every six months on the 13th day of each month on the dot. She was very punctual. Influenza would end up claiming the lives of two of these prophets, leaving only one to share messages with the world, and then only briefly too. Conspiracies and conspiracists state that the things the Virgin Mary told the shepherds weren't quite reported on accurately, and in truth, the church knows the real secrets that were bestowed upon the Fatimans, and that these were way too dangerous to be let out, and had to be suppressed and controlled for fear of civil unrest, possibly pertaining to things that could damage the church's good reputation, or change the nature of society as a whole. Maybe the answer as to whether or not that dress was white and black or gold and blue the whole time. An alternate conspiracy is that there were more secrets that the church knows about but refuses to share. Maybe four secrets of Fatima. That makes sense. They're called the secrets of Fatima, not the tell everybody's of Fatima. You want my theory? My conspiracy? Virgin Mary told those shepherds of Fatima the recipe for KFC and Coke and the Vatican realized quickly that information is just too sensitive. That's got to stay under wraps. Coming in at number three, we have the orphans of Duplessis. In the 1930s and 1940s in Quebec City, it was marred by unprecedented acts of corruption and repression due to a conservative revolution better known as the Great Darkness, which was led by Premier Maurice Duplessis and many of the acts were involving the Catholic Church. In 1940, the Duplessis government and along with the Catholic Church began to diagnose orphan children with mental problems, even though these children were perfectly healthy. Due to this, thousands of orphan children were sent to a psychiatric institution of the church so that the church could receive a government subsidy for the treatment of these children. Unfortunately, this was a reality for so many because mental health wasn't as widely known as today and it was unknown how to treat those suffering back then. At this time, many orphanages were converted into asylums for children and more than 20,000 were misdiagnosed and imprisoned in asylums so that the Catholic Church could earn more money. According to reports, many of these children weren't orphans at all, but children coming from single mothers who were forcibly taken into church custody, and they didn't admit children out of wedlock. The people forced to be involved in this were subjected to nightmares, including drug testing and other medical experiments like electric shock therapy. In the 1990s, almost 3,000 survivors of the Duplessis orphan scandal revealed the horrific events they had to go through, but the government made a sad excuse of a settlement with the victims and the Catholic Church who remained silent to stifle the scandal. In at number two, we have Joan of Arc. Most people know the story of Joan of Arc. She is mostly considered a hero of France for her role during the war. She is now considered a saint, but the Catholic Church hated her. She claimed that she was receiving messages from God, instructions on what she should do to help her people. This angered many higher ranking officials within the church. Joan saw her first vision around the age of 13 in 1425. The figure she identified as Saint Michael surrounded by angels appeared in her garden. After receiving the vision, she wept as she wanted to go with him. Throughout her life, she continued to be visited and given messages from the Lord. By 1428, Joan's visions told her she must leave her home and go to France. Since then, she gained followers and support in her fight to recover France from English domination. The Catholic Church denounced her visions and set out to take her down. In 1430, Joan was captured. She was put on trial for heresy, even though Joan was a devout Christian. They gave Joan as many charges as they could, hoping she would be found guilty of at least one of them. The military were relieved of her capture. They believed her to have supernatural powers. They feared her as it was 
not typical for women to wield such power and command. One of the most well known charges against Joan was that she wore men's clothing, something apparently illegal back then. In reality, this came from the fact that she wore armour while in enemy territory, something not seen as being ladylike for the time. The trial was not conventional for the time, it was clear no matter what she did, they were determined to find her guilty. Although she was impressive during the trial, she was ultimately found guilty. She was found guilty of heresy and sentenced to death. She was to be burned at the stake. Joan is seen as a hero and a saint today. The Catholic Church tries to distance themselves from her mistreatment. And finally, in at number one, we have the Vatican's quest for aliens. It might surprise you to know that the Catholic Church has a keen interest in aliens. They hold a conference each year to talk about astrobiology. If you haven't heard that term before, it's a term they created to make their meetings about aliens seem more legitimate. The Vatican has often defended itself in the public about their interest in extraterrestrial. As they often state, evolution is not something they believe in. You would assume they also didn't believe in aliens. The Vatican even has its own team of scientists looking into the existence of these beings and attempting to make contact. The chief astronomer stated, There is no conflict between believing in God and in the possibility of extraterrestrial brothers, perhaps more evolved than humans. He went on to explain that you cannot put limits on God's creative freedom, so it makes sense after creating Earth, he would go to create other beings. Some even believe that humans are lost sheep of the universe, and we need to find the more evolved of God's creations. All of this would not be such a surprise if they hadn't condemned science since the creation of the church. In the 17th century, they condemned the astronomer Galileo for insisting that the Earth revolved around the sun. It seems they had progressed in some of their beliefs since then. Some believe that they spent a lot of money on their exploration into space and have even discovered a few things that they are keeping to themselves. Some historians believe that within the Vatican secret archive, there is evidence of contact with extraterrestrials. It is not known why they would keep this information from the world. Do they want to use it to further their beliefs, or maybe they don't consider everyone to be worthy? We do know there are stories of communication with other beings, but the information is mostly kept with the church. In 1917, three children saw the Virgin Mary who gave them a telepathic message. The message was that we are not alone on the planet. They warned that humanity needs to prepare for their return. The Catholic Church censored these messages. The only person who knew the full content of the message was the Pope, who refused to release the details of all three. This is just one instance of messages received on Earth that have been hurled by the Vatican for years. It is believed they have no intention to release this information. The archive is heavily guarded. Who knows what could be hidden within their findings? Number five, a close personal working relationship with Benito Mussolini. The Vatican isn't just the seat of the Catholic Church. It's also the smallest country in the world. Did you know that? Despite existing inside of Italy, the Vatican isn't part of Italy, but rather its own country, a little sovereign state. About a thousand people live there total. But it hasn't always been that way though. It wasn't founded as its own separate city. And the reason it became that way is a little darker than I'm sure the church would like to admit to, a treaty with infamous fascist leader Benito Mussolini. In 1922, Mussolini and the National Fascist Party came to power crushing democracy and putting up a pretty hostile dictatorship in its place. In 1929, Mussolini and the church came together to meet and sign a treaty, granting the church the status as a private enclave, a sovereign state inside of Italy. The deal was, Mussolini wouldn't bother the Vatican, and they wouldn't bother him. Mussolini even paid out a massive, massive settlement, which the church invested and is believed to have been valued at 780 million dollars. Alongside the church getting tax exemption status and priests getting a healthy salary from the Italian government. All of those benefits you can thank fascist leader Benito Mussolini for. Perhaps most illuminating, however, was a clause that protected the Vatican's dignity, so to speak. Meaning as part of their laws as a sovereign state, they were allowed to arrest and try anyone who criticized the people and the church. In exchange for signing this treaty, the Catholic Church publicly supported the fascist dictatorship and was recognized as Italy's official government. The Vatican's own newspaper printed shortly after the deal went down, Italy has been given back to God and God to Italy. And they had the support of someone who was involved in hundreds of thousands of deaths to thank. Isn't that fun? And if you're looking for way more church conspiracies, old secrets, relics, all kinds of things, ghouls, goblins, aliens galore, top five scary, has all of that and then some. Really, we'll do just about anything on this channel. I'm talking about the church right now. So hit subscribe, make sure you ring that little bell as well so you don't miss a single scream. 
but you do that at the end of this video, okay? Because I got four more church scandals coming up for you right now. Number four, the banquet of chestnuts. Believe it or not, this might shock you, more than a few popes have been less than pious. You know, we'll go deeper later in the list, but several, several popes would be on the naughty list. Among them, Alexander VI, who you might know better as Rodrigo Borgia. Rodrigo was said to have some pretty bizarre hobbies, even by papal standards. He apparently loved to watch horses mate. That was apparently one of his favorite ways to spend an afternoon. Once or twice, sure, you know, we all get curious, Rodrigo, but, but frequently, I, I don't know, man, I, I don't know. Maybe you have to be there. Anyway. That's not even the most controversial thing the Borgias were involved in. Seriously, look up the Borgias after this video, there was a lot. One of the most infamous things Rodrigo got involved in was called the Banquet of Chestnuts, sometimes referred to a little more colloquially as the Joust of... I don't really think I can say this and stay in the family-friendly guidelines. The joust of women of the night, if you know what I mean. Are you, are you following? It's a word that they say in Game of Thrones a lot. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, maybe you're not old enough to be watching this channel. The joust that shall not be named wasn't quite a literal joust, although there was a great deal of thrusting and charging. <clears throat> Excuse me. Cesare Borgia, real life Jamie Lannister and one time Assassin's Creed Brotherhood villain, arranged a banquet in his chambers in the Vatican with 50 of the hardest working courtesans of the time. They danced after dinner, then disrobed, and then the joust began. Rodrigo and his family gleefully threw chestnuts on the floor for forcing the women to grovel around their feet like swine. They offered prizes, clothes, jewelry, all sorts of baubles for the man who could fornicate with the most courtesans, which is, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> that's a pretty interesting event for the Pope to preside over. Think about the next time you're at an official church event in your community, like a, like a bake sale or something. Just think about the other events the head of the Catholic Church and the voice that speaks to God was holding and participating in. Number three, proof of aliens. Well, we already talked a little bit about some of the credible technology that could be inside this archive. And it's thought that the Vatican has all sorts of incredible information hidden away in its vaults that humanity, we're just not ready to know about. We're not grown up enough. One of the other leading ones is that theorists speculate that inside those secret, secret archives is indisputable hard evidence of extraterrestrial life. That they're harboring alien skulls and remnants of amazing technology. I guess on borrow from Area 51's collection it's traveling. So the story goes that in the late 1960s during renovations of the Vatican's archives, excavators uncovered alien skulls beneath the Vatican archives and somewhere the predator is so upset that he lost those. Is it possible that they worried that if proof of extraterrestrial life got out into the wild it would discredit belief? Yeah, out there. It wouldn't be the first time, you know, Galileo was famously locked up for his wild beliefs about the celestial bodies that would turn out to be fairly true. So would aliens be any different, really a different story? A Russian engineer named Genrik Marvikic Ludwig was an esteemed scholar who in the 1920s was invited to the secret archives to study. A very prestigious position offered to like less than a thousand scholars a year. According to him, while there, he uncovered documentations that discussed the influence of aliens on civilizations like the Egyptians, the Mayans, the Mesopotamians. Ludwig found records of use of atomic weaponry predating the Manhattan Project, suggesting that this hyper-advanced technology had been in use for years and humanity's leaps and progress were all reverse engineered from our visitors. Maybe the pyramids really were aliens. <laughs> Would certainly be something if that ever came out. I hope in our lifetime, you know, I hope we get to see some aliens and I hope we get to see an alien elected pope someday personally. Number two, proof Jesus never existed or did. Now among the things that you would think the Vatican would really want to keep hidden and on the DL would be proof that the Lord and Savior did not exist. This is another popular conspiracy theory emanating about the Vatican that one of the things they're trying to cover up is some alleged document that insists Jesus as we know him wasn't quite real or wasn't as reported accurately. That would make sense. If I was the Pope, that would be like the number one thing I would want to keep under wraps, right? That would probably destroy the church overnight if that ever came out. Now on the inverse of this theory is a similar theory, totally different direction though, stating that the Vatican secret archives contains indisputable proof that Jesus did exist 
including correspondences between St. Paul and Emperor Nero, history's favorite bad boy, contemporary paintings and depictions of the man, which would be pretty groundbreaking. You'd wonder though, if they, if they have that, why would they keep that secret? You know, I would, I would leak that one. Now, if you believe this conspiracy and you can carry on with it, it does get a little wild. One author, one Michael Bagnet, claims that the correspondences inside the archives, they prove Jesus did exist, but here's a crazy twist. He didn't die on the cross, as you know, we all know, but rather there was a very complicated scheme with Pontius Pilate to secretly fake Jesus' death to appease the citizens of Rome. Sounds a little bit more like the plot line to a Dan Brown novel. It's a little fantastical, and if true, would probably be the greatest conspiracy theory in, in human history and maybe humanity's most tightly guarded secrets if there's any weight to it. So definitely, you know, if they knew that, they would probably keep that under wraps, keep that in a drawer, <laughs> locked up tight, not let anybody see that. And number one, the Illuminati. Maybe this is one of the most widespread conspiratorial beliefs, maybe one of the oldest conspiracy theories out there, really is that the Illuminati, the centuries old secret society that once started in Bavaria, would eventually grow into an organization capable of challenging the church and overtaking it. And if you believe the conspiracies, it's clandestinely pulling the strings behind everything, controlling the world from the shadows, inserting key members of its order into the highest levels of government, religion, the Disney Corporation, the rap industry, and also including their symbols hidden in everything. That one, I guess, just for like fun, <laughs> just to, I don't know, flex. May I just say though, if the Illuminati are real and, and controlling things, they have got to be the least kept secret order like imaginable since, you know, I'm talking about them. <laughs> Well, the conspiracy goes that the Vatican is closely, closely tied with the Illuminati, with some believing that cardinals and the papacy are all tied to Illuminati interests, and that the secret archives contain bountiful proof of this, memos, meetings, plans for world domination, etc. The Vatican's archives date back centuries, nearly a thousand years worth of old papers, with some documents containing secrets of the Knights Templar, who are thought to be the originators of Freemasonry, the group that would become tied with the Illuminati, that's who the Illuminati was based on. Surely some of those Knight Templar meeting minutes would be particularly illuminating, if you'll pardon that absolutely horrible pun. Of all the ones on this list, I think this one is the most outright likely, since we know the Illuminati did stem from the Freemasons, and we know that there was a real Illuminati, that's an indisputable fact, and we know the Knights Templar, we know all of these groups did exist, and it's very likely that there are some secrets inside the Vatican's archive containing references to those three groups that could fuel the plot lines for the next 12 years of Assassin's Creed games. We got some good conspiracy stuff in there. Number five on this list is Cadaver Sinyad. This is one of the weirdest events in history, guys. Daily Gister says, In 897, the Vatican saw one of the most bizarre episodes in history. The corpse of a pope was put on trial by his living successor. Pope Formosus, dead for a few months, was hardly qualified to defend himself in a court of law. Nonetheless, Pope Stephen VI had the body disinterred, dressed in robes, and propped up on the papal throne to stand trial. He even appointed a deacon to speak on the corpse's behalf. While Stephen VI hurled accusations at Formosus, the accused remained stoically silent, as might be expected of a corpse. The dead pope was found guilty of usurping the papacy. Stephen VI declared all of his acts as pope null and void, all consecrations, all appointments, all ordinations were undone. So as you guys can imagine, the church doesn't really talk about this episode too much because it's kind of embarrassing honestly. Clearly the current pope during this time was not fit to be in charge at all and might have even been losing his mind a little bit. This is pretty dumb, but at least it makes for a good story to tell at a dinner party or something. So there, stuff that one in your back pocket and save it for later, guys. Number four on this list is Sixtus the Sixth. Sixtus the Sixth was a pope who was in power back in the late 1400s. He definitely made some questionable life choices though, some of which I'm sure the church would love to forget. Business Insider writes, Sixtus the Sixth, elected in 1471, apparently had six illegitimate children, including one with his sister. That didn't stop him from policing the sexual appetites of the underlings, though. He created a church tax on and charged priests for having mistresses. 
Sixtus VI also had a taste for nepotism, as did many other popes. He made six of his nephews cardinals. My dude literally had a kid with his sister. I'm an only child, so I don't really know what it's like to have a sibling, but even I'm grossed out about hearing that. Obviously, it's a pretty bad look for the church when their literal leader is shacking up with his sis. Something that I don't think God or the Bible is going to look too kindly upon. Number 3. Killing Joan of Arc Over Pants Joan of Arc is a very familiar name to Catholics and, well, just about everybody. She's a pretty famous historical figure. You probably know her famously as a saint. You might recognize her as a force for feminism. I think she was in one of the Bill and Ted movies. Well, her status as a saint came a long time after some trouble she was embroiled in with the church, who at one time saw her as an enemy to their very ideals, going so far as to consider her their number one enemy. In 1429, the young Joan of Arc believed that God had spoken out to her and helped instigate an uprising to get the English out of France. Very cool for the French people who wanted them gone, but some high-ranking influential members of the clergy who had ties to the English weren't terribly fond of this wild woman who was going around dressing like a man and claiming that God speak to her and was kicking all of their friends out of the country. Somebody do something about this wild woman. When King Charles VII enjoyed Joan's help during the many battles against the English, when Joan was captured by English forces, she learned the true extent of his loyalty when he handed her over to the Catholic Church to stand trial for heresy. After all, she was claiming she talked to God. And only the Pope is supposed to do that. And worst of all, Joan of Arc was wearing pants. She was wearing pants while doing it like a man. So Joan was put on trial for heresy and denied counsel, which is against her rights. Saul Goodman would have been furious. Regardless, Joan kept her cool rather famously and is, is famed for her level head. Joan was found guilty of being a rebellious spirit who wore men's clothes and for these indignations was burned alive at the stake in front of a cheering crowd. In 1456, some 25 years after her horrific death, King Charles VII felt kind of bad about that whole ordeal ordered an investigation and made her a martyr. It wasn't until 1920 that she was officially canonized as a saint. Think of it like a like a heavenly apology. Uh, I'm sure the water's fine, I'm sure the air is cool, no bad blood between Joan and the Catholic Church. I bet she's having a great time. I'm sure she appreciated it. Number two, buying redemption. Can man find redemption? Can the weight of our sins be undone? Can a person truly change his course? Can an evil man become good? These lofty questions have dominated the hearts of man for years, inspiring countless great works of art and philosophical conundrum. At religion's heart is the concept of salvation and redemption. So it might strike you as more than a little bit bizarre that at one point in time, the Catholic Church was selling absolution for a price tag. Now before we get into that, we need to talk quickly about an indulgence. No, not eating an extra large cheese pizza by yourself, but that is an indulgence of sorts. If you're like me and you've skipped Sunday Mass for the last 26 years, basically an indulgence in Catholic terms is sort of like a plan or a plea for absolving your sins. Something you have to do to absolve yourself. Uh, 30 Hail Marys, con confession, that sort of stuff. In the early 15th century, after Pope Julius died, Pope Leo X would inherit the papacy. Leo loved the pleasures that came with being Pope. He loved the big hat. He loved spending lavishly. He loved voluptuous entertainment. He loved living like a king not a pope. It took him eight years to completely drain the Vatican's treasury, which other popes weren't really doing. So when St. Peter's Basilica was in the process of being rebuilt, they were plain out of money and needed a fundraiser. But instead of selling Girl Guide cookies door to door, Leo announced that anyone who contributed money to the church would be granted an indulgence. Now, an indulgence was supposed to be a path laid out by a church for your betterment, but it was hawked as if you were buying a sin redemption ticket, like a get out of hell free card. Dominican friar John Testel was named the Grand Commissioner of Indulgences in Germany. Seeing Overseeing indulgences was his only job. That's the only thing this guy did to give you a sense of how many people were doing this. He sold absolution for future sins you were planning to commit later. Pay a small fee, and if you kill a guy next week, totally fine, God says it's okay. Now this probably worked pretty decent if you had a bit of coin, but if you were an average person, a serf like me, perhaps, uh, you did your best to prepare for an eternity in hell. Salvation was just another pleasure the rich had, and hell is where us poors go. Unsurprisingly, 
someone got very upset about this new stance from the church. He was pretty upset about this. His name was Martin Luther, and he passive aggressively left a note on some doors like an upset roommate. And I, I can't remember if anything ever came out of that, if anything ever happened to him in history. It's it's lost to time. It's probably unimportant. Number one, the plot of Assassin's Creed 2 was real. <laughs> If you've garnered anything from this video, I sincerely hope it's that the Pope oftentimes does not follow the rules. Yes, the guy interprets the will of God, and he's got a direct phone line to him directly, but that doesn't mean he has to follow every single one of his rules. We've already discussed some truly wild sins, horse mating, chestnut parties, spending money, but let's top it all off with the biggest one, a full-blown assassination conspiracy revolving around a Pope ordering a hitman. And you just sit on that for a second. In the 1470s, Pope Sixtus IV hatched a scheme to get Flo to rid Florence of the Medicis, who was the most influential family in the country at the time, with such power that they rivaled the church. The Medicis had served as the bankers for the papacy for generations, and as such were absurdly wealthy. Pope Sixtus kickstarted this conflict when he swapped the Medicis as the papal bankers to the Pazzi family. Oh, ho, ho, no, 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 no. The Medicis didn't want to fund the Pope's uh, claim of the town of Imola, which the Medicis wanted to claim for themselves to lord over. So, something had to be done about these meddling Medicis. Pope Sixtus contracted two assassins to carry out the plot against Lorenzo and Giuliano de' Medici during Easter Mass on a Sunday which just feels unbelievably disrespectful to me. If you're the Pope, I mean, ordering an assassin against anybody, morally gray, but doing it on Easter Mass? You're not even allowed to talk in church, but you can orchestrate a political assassin? I don't know. Now, if you're sitting listening to this and you're kind of wondering why some of this sounds vaguely familiar and you don't know why you recognize these names, it's because you might recognize this plotline in between jumping into Bales of Hay as being a major force in Assassin's Creed 2, where protagonist Ezio Aritore da Frienze ends up helping out Lorenzo Medici a great deal. Yes! The games were really inspired by true history, save for a few extendo blades and boss fights against the Pope. Uh, Rodrigo Borgia, as far as we know, never got into a fist fight with any assassins and wasn't killed by Cesare, but I digress. If you remember from Assassin's Creed 2, Giuliano was fatally slain, but Lorenzo survived and rallied support of Florence in a war against the church. Lorenzo picked off conspirators, sorry, Ezio picked off conspirators, and then sailed to Naples to meet King Ferdinand to discuss a peaceful solution to the bubbling war. So in the end, the plot failed drastically because all it really did was make people think that Lorenzo Medici was the coolest guy around and brought intense shame to Pope Sixtus and it inspired one of the best games Ubisoft ever made.